Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're just looking at 10 facts every Christian should know about the canon of the New Testament. Now, these 10 facts are taken from a blog series uh, from Michael J. Kruger. Uh, you can get uh, the book, Canon Revisited, which is the book uh, of the blog series in book form. Um, I'm just going to give you a little snippet of each of the facts um, and you can get uh, the full blog series at um, HTP Michael um, <clears throat> so The first fact uh, that Kruger says is that the New Testament books are the earliest Christian writings we possess. Um, so he, he notes um, one of the most formidable challenges in any discussion about the New Testament canon is explaining what makes these 27 books, books unique, why these are not others. There are many answers to that question, but in this blog post, we are focused on just one, the date of these books. He goes, this is particularly evident when it comes to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the only Gospel accounts that derive from the first century. Sure, there are a few scholars attempted to put the top Gospel of Thomas in the first century, but this has not met with much success. After all, the scholarly dust has settled. Even critics agree that these... All the apocrypha material is the second century. Okay, so that's fact number one that you need to remember. Uh, fact number two: Every Christian should memorize apocryphal writings are all written in the second century or later. Um, he goes in the current post. We address the issues of apocryphal New Testament writings. These are writings that are not included in the New Testament. And these are writings are often attributed to famous individuals, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, Acts of John. Uh, what particularly is noteworthy about this fact is that even critical scholars agree, while there is dispute over the dating of some New Testament books to Peter, the pastoral epistles, there is virtually unanimity, unanimity over the late date of the apocryphal books. These are, of course, fringe attempts to place some apocryphal writings into the first century e.g. Crossan, um, but they are fringe. Um, and so basically uh, Kruger makes a point that the apocryphal writings are second century, which is very important. He then goes on to his third fact. Um, the New Testament books are unique because they are apostolic books. Uh, he, he goes on and says Jesus had commissioned his apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority, Mark 3, 14, 15. Uh, and so basically he's saying that the early church had an understanding that the apostles had authority. In fact, he, he says, the church overt dependence on apostolic writings is precisely why we see a proliferation of apocryphal books in the second century and later that were named after the apostles. So that's a very important fact to know that we can trace the New Testament as authoritative because they come from the apostles or connected to the apostles in some way. The fourth fact is that the New Testament writers quote other New Testament writers. So we have 2 Peter 3 2, which quotes uh, Paul and um, 1 Timothy 5.18, which is quoted in Luke. And what that tells you is that there was already an acceptance, acceptance of what was authoritative because they're quoting even New Testament books. The fifth fact, um, which uh, Kruger points out, is the four Gospels were 
well established. Uh, when it comes to the basic facts of which we live and four principal winds and the cherubim too were four faced so even early on there was a sense that the four gospels was uh, authoritative fact number six the moratorium fragment uh, lists 22 of the 27 New Testament books um, He writes, of course, it should be acknowledged that the moratorium fragment ca moratorium canon also seem to affirm the apocalypse of Peter. However, the author of the fragment immediately expresses that some have hesitation about this book. Those hesitations eventually won out, and the apocalypse of Peter was never widely affirmed by the early church. It never earned a final spot in the canon. The fact that there was some disagreement during this time period over a few peripheral books should not surprise us. It took some time for the issue of the canon to be settled. This occasional agreement, however, should not keep us from observing the larger and broader unity that early Christians shared regarding the core of the New Testament books. So the moratorium fragment is basically saying very early on that out of the 27 books, 20 22 were firmly established and accepted. There was a few uh, of the New Testament books that people were still discussing. Uh, but what that tells you is very early on there was a a belief of the general core of the New Testament as accepted. The next fact is early Christians often used non-canonical writings but what's uh, often not uh, stated by scholars which needs to be told is that there is a uh, there is definitely uh, just be it, it, it's often used by modern scholars and people who are arguing against the New Testament that look the early church father others quoted uh, for books so therefore they they were not as clear about what the New Testament was but J. A. Brooks for instance has observed that Clement cites the canonical books about 16 times more often than the apocryphal and patristic writings when it comes to gospels the evidence is even better Clement cites apocryphal gospels only 16 times where he cites just the gospel of Matthew 757 times in sum, Christians need to memorize the simple fact about the New Testament canon, says Kruger. Early Christians used many other books besides those that made it into our Bible, but this should not surprise us. The next uh, fact, number eight, the next fact is the Council of Nicaea did not decide Not decide the canon the follow-up question is usually which council did decide the canon and and this is a misunderstanding no council decided the canon the canon of scripture the New Testament was generally uh, something that was thrashed out over a long period of time but there was a general acceptance of most of the books because the church was using these books uh, and um, so there we are number nine Fact number nine, Christians did disagree about the canonicity of some books. When it comes to the basic facts that all Christians should know about the canon, it's important, says Kruger, that we recognize that the development of the canon was not always neat and tidy. It was not pristine problem-free process where everyone agreed on every right from the outset. On the contrary, the history of the canon is, at points, quite tumultuous. So basically there were difficult decisions and wrong decisions made sometimes and you know that's just the fact of the historical uh, study of how the New Testament came to be. Um, basically the, the, the New Testament won out because it, it, it over a long period of time people began to see the value of these books. 
But over that long period of time, some writers said some books were not canonical and some writers said other books that are apocryphal are canonical and there were disputes and discussion. But over time, uh, these things got ironed out. But those are the facts. Number 10. Um, early Christians believed that canonical books were self-authenticating. How do we know which books are from God and which are not? There are many answers to that question, he says. But it's interesting to note that the early church fathers, while agreeing that apostolicy and church reception are fundamentally important, also appeal to another factor that is often overlooked in modern studies, the appeal to the internal qualities of these books. In other words, they argue that these books bore certain attributes that distinguish them as being from God. They argue that they could hear the voice of their Lord in these particular books. In modern theological language, they believe that canonical books are self-authenticating. As said, Jesus, my sheep, hear my voice, and I know them. Origen is quite clear that the divine qualities of books play a, a role in their authentication. He says, if anyone ponders over the prophetic sayings, it is certain that in the very act of reading and diligently studying them, his mind and feeling will be touched by a divine breath, and he will recognize the words he is reading are not utterances of man, but the language of God. So those are the ten basic facts. What a, a wonderful, absolutely wonderful uh, series there. Uh, I've just done little quotes, and um, you can listen to uh, Kruger's lectures. Uh, here's You, oh, sorry. Um, you have to download it. Uh, but there's quite a lot of uh, lectures that you can listen to. Quite a few lectures on the canon that you can listen to there, and you'll find a blessing. Uh, get all of the book Canon Revisited. I like Michael J. Kruger. I think he's a really good scholar. Uh, I really enjoy listening to him, and. Um, so there we are. I've just given you uh, an edited version. I read through his 10 series and then memorized it and then just gone back over it quickly and just given you a few pointers that he said in my own words generally and with a few quotations of his. Okay? So get hold of the book and uh, it'll be a real blessing to you. Take care now and God bless.